Lesson 5.2, Evaluate and Graph Polynomial Functions. In this lesson, we'll look at the specifics of polynomial functions, we'll look at end behavior, and we'll sketch graphs. The definition of a polynomial is a monomial or sum of monomials. Monomial would mean one term, polynomial means many terms. In a polynomial function, all coefficients are real numbers. We're not going to have i in a polynomial, and we won't have the square root of a negative value as a coefficient. The exponents are all whole numbers. We won't have any exponents that are fractions or negative. In our first example, it says let f of x equal 3x cubed minus 2x plus 5x to the 6th plus 1 plus 4x to the 5th minus 8x to the 4th plus 4x squared. That's definitely a polynomial, many terms. Now, standard form is when all of the exponents are in descending order. That means you write the term with the biggest exponent first, all the way down to the very last term, which is known as the constant, that doesn't have an exponent at all. To rewrite f of x in standard form, I wrote f of x equals to start off, and then recognize that the biggest term, or the biggest exponent, was 5x to the 6th power. I started with that, and then just went from there, plus 4x to the 5th, minus 8x to the 4th, plus 3x cubed, minus 4x squared, excuse me, plus 4x squared, minus 2x plus 1. That's rewriting that function in standard form. Now there's a lot of information that we can look at based on this polynomial. The degree is the value of the biggest exponent. That's called the degree of the function. And in this case, the degree is going to be 6. That's the value of the biggest exponent. From there, other terms that we can look at is the leading term, which is just the first term when written in standard form. And that includes the coefficient out in front, this would be 5x to the 6th, that is the leading term. Now, the difference between leading term and leading coefficient, coefficient is just the number out in front of that lead term. So that's just the first number. In this case, it's 5. The lead coefficient is that number that starts off the polynomial. Now, we've worked with constant before, and the constant is just the number without a, and we're without a variable. So there's no variable. So the number with no variable. Can you decide what the constant is in this polynomial? That's just that number at the very end, 1. Other types of terms that we'll work with pretty much or pretty consistently throughout this chapter, if you have something called a linear term, oh, I don't know why that's highlighted, hang tight. A linear term is the term that just has the plane x variable. So the plane x to the first term. And in this case, that would be negative 2x. That one is the variable or the term that has x to the first power. And then we have quadratic term, and we've worked a lot with quadratics before. That's the x to the squared term. And sometimes they don't have these types of terms within the given polynomial. But in this case, we do have an x to the squared term. That would be 4x squared. And then last but not least, another one we could look at is a cubic term. So cubic means x to the third power. And in this polynomial, that would be 3x to the third. So take a look at all of these terms, and as we go through different types of polynomials, try to recognize what all of these are in any given example. Decide whether the equation is a polynomial function. If so, write it in standard form, state the degree, the leading coefficient, and the quadratic term. If it isn't, say why. For example, a, f of x equals 4x to the third plus 5x to the negative 1 minus 4. Now remember, the definition at the top for a polynomial is that all coefficients are real numbers and all exponents are whole numbers. If we look at coefficients first, we have a 4, a 5, and a negative 4. All of our coefficients are real numbers, so that part's fine. 
However, when we look at our exponents, we've got a three, which is a whole number, but then we have negative one. And negative one isn't a whole number exponent. Because of that, this example of, uh, of a polynomial is not a polynomial function. So we're just going to say not a function. And then that's all we'd have to do with that. We could work with it, but it's just not ex ex described as a polynomial function. Over on the right, let's try p of x. We have p of x equals 9x to the third minus 3x plus 8 minus 12x to the fifth. First, let's start with our coefficients. We've got 9, negative 3, 8 as a constant, and negative 12. All of our coefficients are real numbers. We have an x to the third, which is a whole number, technically x to the first. Our constant doesn't need an exponent, and x to the fifth. This means all of our exponents are, in fact, whole numbers. So yes, this is a polynomial. Now it says write it in standard form, so I'm just going to start with p of x equals. Now it looks like x to the third isn't the biggest exponent. It looks like negative 12 x to the fifth is the biggest exponent. And then we don't have an x to the fourth, so then that 9x to the third goes next, and then minus 3x to the first, and plus 8. That would be our polynomial in standard form. Now the degree, remember, is the biggest exponent, and in this case it's 5. The leading coefficient, I'm just going to go LC, the leading coefficient is just the number out in front, and that would be negative 12. Now, the interesting thing here, if we look for a quadratic term, I don't see anything with an x squared, so there's no x squared term. That means there's no quadratic term in this given polynomial. Evaluating polynomials. It says let f of x equal 2x to the fourth minus 5x to the third minus 4x plus 8. Find f of 3. We've done this before. We just haven't done this with so many exponents. What we're just going to do is plug in x equals 3. And this is why you want your calculator. So we're going to write f of 3 equals 2 times x to the third. Whoa, whoa what am I doing? Sorry, if x is 3. 2 times 3 to the 4th power, minus 5 times 3 to the 3rd power, minus 4 times 3, plus 8. And then you literally just plug this all in, using the parentheses and making sure you can get the exponents to show up on your calculator. If you can't find how that works, it might be like a little arrow button up, looks like this, or you may have a y to the x button, and once you hit that, then you can type in your exponent. So try to find one of those, and if you're not quite sure how to get that to work, let me know and we can get that fixed on your calculator. Plugging in 2 x to the or 2 times 3 to the 4th, minus 5 times 3 to the 3rd, minus 4 times 3 plus 8 should give you an output of 23. Make sure you can get that answer. So when you literally just plug this in directly to the equation and evaluate, it's called direct substitution. That's when you plug in a value for x and simplify. Synthetic substitution is an alternative to direct substitution. And we'll use synthetic substitution later on in this chapter as a different option for a method. Now, synthetic substitution, what it does is it uses all of the coefficients for your polynomial and not the x variables to evaluate. Now, the polynomial must be in standard form for this to work. And unlike direct substitution, you have to have all terms represented. If you don't, you have to plug in 0 as a placeholder, and we'll see that example down below. Use synthetic substitution to evaluate the polynomial function. f of x equals 2x to the fourth minus 5x to the third minus 4x plus 8 when x equals 3. 
Hopefully this sounds familiar to you. This is the exact same problem we plugged in with direct substitution on the other page. To do synthetic substitution, we're going to take our value for x that we want to plug in and put it over here kind of out in front. And then I'm going to take my coefficients and list them in order. But recognize we're missing x to the second. We're missing our quadratic term. So watch what happens when I use my coefficients. I'm going to start with my lead coefficient, and then I'm going to put negative 5 right next to it. And then because x squared is missing, I'm going to put a zero placeholder before I go back to my negative 4. And then last but not least, I end with my constant of 8. So take a look at all of those values, 2 and then negative 5, 0 to represent that x squared kind of location, then negative 4 and 8. From here, give yourself kind of a row to plug in numbers and then just draw a line straight across. This is what synthetic substitution looks like. Take that lead coefficient and drop it down below that line. Anything that you drop below the line, you multiply with that 3 out in front. 3 times 2 is 6. And guess what? That goes in the next column. And now we just add together. Negative 5 plus 6 is 1, and that goes below the line. Then multiply again. 3 times 1 is 3, and that goes to the next column. Add the column together. 0 plus 3 is 3. And we just keep repeating that process. Arrows are optional. You don't have to draw these arrows in. I'm just trying to help you show the process. 3 on the outside times the 3 on the bottom is 9, and that goes next. And then we add that column together. Negative 4 plus 9 is 5. Last but not least, 3 times 5 is 15. And when we add that together, we get 23. Now, 23 hopefully sounds familiar to you because that was the answer we got with direct substitution. And it's the same answer that we get with synthetic. So f of 3 equals 23. Let's try the other one. g of x equals 3x to the 5th plus 7x minus 4x squared minus 1. And we want to evaluate this when x equals negative 2. Wow, when I look at this polynomial, we are missing quite a few things, and it's not in standard form. So let's start just by putting it in standard form and plugging in 0 as any placeholder that, placeholders that we need. Looking at all of our exponents, it appears to be the degree is going to be 5. That means 3x to the 5th is in the right spot. But then we don't have an x to the 4th term, nor do we have an x to the 3rd term. That means I have to have 0 for both placeholder kind of coefficients. And then there is, let's see, minus 4x squared, that would go next, plus 7x, minus 1. Woohoo, that's our polynomial in standard form. Now if we want to evaluate for x equals negative 2, that's where we start. We put negative 2 on the outside, and then we list just the coefficients. So we've got 3, a 0, another 0, negative 4, 7, and negative 1. Now remember, give yourself a line or like a row in between and then draw that line. Now to evaluate, we're still going to do that up and down thing with the arrows, but this time I'm not going to draw quite as many arrows out. Take the first, that lead coefficient, and that always just goes right below the line. Multiply that to the negative 2. 3 times negative 2 is negative 6. I'm going to put that here. Now when we add negative 6, technically it stays subtraction. 0 plus negative 6 is negative 6. Multiply that to the negative 2 out in front. Negative 6 times negative 2 is 12. If I add that column, 0 plus 12 is 12. Now, see if you can keep going and finish and decide what you get at the very end. Pause the video, and then when you think you have it, press play, and we'll see how it went. Did you get g of negative 2 equals negative 127? Hopefully. Notice I multiplied the 12 by negative 2, and I put negative 24 in the next column, added that and got negative 28, multiplied by negative 2 again, and got positive 56. Now 7 plus 56 is 63. Multiply by negative 2 one last time to get negative 126. And that means if we were graphing this function 
At negative two on the x-axis, the y value or the output would be all the way down at negative 127. Our last part of this video lesson is taking a look at different types of polynomial functions. Some of them will look familiar and then some of them will be new. Let's start with linear functions, y equals ax plus b. Notice I switched out mx plus b to ax plus b. As our lead coefficient, we just want to keep that like location or that letter the consistent throughout each polynomial. In a, in a linear function, the degree is just 1 because your biggest exponent is 1. And your lead coefficient is that a value out in front. And that will decide the direction of your linear function. So a linear function is just a line. Go ahead and draw your line anywhere throughout your graph. If a is positive, the line goes up from left to right, and if a is negative, the line would go down from left to right. The next function that we know a little bit about is quadratic functions, and the standard form template is y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. We know that. We spent a lot of time on that one. Now in this type of polynomial function, the degree is 2. That's the biggest exponent. And that lead coefficient, if you remember from graphing in chapter 4, will decide if the arrows point up or point down. Now if it's positive, the arrows both point up from left to right, and if it's negative, the arrows both point down. And that's how we kind of sketched our graphs for quadratic functions in standard form. As our polynomial degree becomes bigger and bigger, the type of function is going to look unique on the graph. A cubic function means that your degree is 3. The biggest exponent is x to the third power. And if your lead coefficient is a, what this is going to do to your graph is kind of like take the line right up above it and put a little curve in the middle. So here's what I mean by that. If a is positive, the line is, or the graph is still going to increase from left to right, but we may have kind of a change in the shape in the middle. So watch this. If we have a lead coefficient that's positive, our graph will go up and then come down and then maybe go up again. So it's not a linear function, but the arrows go in opposite directions from left to right. And that's a type of cubic function. Kicking up our degree to 4, this becomes now a quartic function. So kind of like quadratic up above, an even degree is going to have your arrows go in the same direction. Also like quadratics, if A is positive, the arrows will point up, but if A is negative, the arrows will point down. The shape for this graph will kind of look like the parabola up above, but with a dip in the middle. So if we think the A value is negative, this means the arrows would be at the bottom. But instead of looking like a parabola that opens down, this is going to look kind of like an M shape. So maybe it goes way up here and looks something like this. That's an example of a quartic function. And our last named polynomial function, I know this is a long video, my apologies you guys. Our last named polynomial function is a quintic function. And that's when you have a lead term with an exponent or a degree of the function of 5. Whoa! And if our lead coefficient is a, a lot like linear and cubic, quintic functions will have arrows in the opposite directions. But if the exponent is bigger than 3, that means you're going to have more than one little kind of curve in the shape. So let's say a is negative this time, and so now it's going to decrease from left to right. It'll maybe go down and then up and then down and then up again. So it just kind of has that weird little blip in the middle, but arrows go in opposite directions. Wow, okay, that's a lot of content for the first part of 5.2.